I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my daily life living in Central America. Today, you've heard the news. You're all aware that everything is melting down in the United States and around the world. This is not unique to the U.S., but disaster is happening. The stock market is crashing. There is panic. There is talk of a major recession, and there is a massive wiping out of your stock value, leaving many of you with much smaller retirements and much less, much smaller buying power. For those who watch my channel regularly, we often talk about relocation, becoming an expat, becoming an immigrant, living abroad, and how you can get more out of your retirement, out of your savings, out of your income by living outside of your home country, often the United States. And so this potentially has some pretty big impact for my audience. We're going to talk about what that means, what you can, what you can expect, and what you need to be doing, how you need to be thinking about this as this all unfolds. So let's get to that bump. If you're a regular on my channel, you know that I am contrarian and I am out here to tell you that the information you're receiving in most cases is false. Now, of course, it is not false that the US stock market has taken a big hit. It is not false that there is a potential of a major recession, but only potential. It is not false that there is some financial panic and all of that. That is fine. The question is, is this wiping out your savings? Is this destroying your opportunity for retirement? Are you going to have to work until you die because you have no way to have any savings for the future because your stocks have been wiped out? So that is the question. That is what we have to address. And what do you do about it right now? Because you're churning inside, you're panicking. What do you do? Okay. Now I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving you financial advice. I'm just giving you common sense and information that everyone should have. So when we look historically, this is one of the most important things. Let's back up. The thing that is crashing in the United States is stocks. So the stock market, which if you don't understand how that works, this is probably not the right channel to be explaining that, but go check out my video on blind capitalism because we break down why the US market is different than everywhere else in the world and why people tend to be worried about stock markets where everywhere else they're just not, right? So the US is unique in that this is such a big deal. Of course, Japan is kind of related and the Nikkei took its biggest loss since 1987 yesterday. So this is a major concern. We're definitely worried about things, no question. Except it's important to remember what we're talking about is market capitalization or market cap. What this is, is the amount that people are currently willing to spend in buying bits of ownership of other companies. And because in the United States that there is blind capitalism, meaning people are buying into pools of buyers where they don't actually know what they're buying in many cases, uh, or if they do, they don't have a really good insight inside the company to know what they've purchased. Uh, they don't have direct control in most cases you end up with people viewing the world through market capitalization, either of individual stocks or of the market in general, and using this as, as grand indicators. But it's not actually the good indicator that you would hope it is, and it's unique to some markets. There's very few places in the world that actually use these systems in a meaningful way on any scale. Of course, we have them here, they have them in China, but they don't mean the same things that they mean in the US. So like that they exist, eh, it's all over the place. In the US, people tend to put a lot of stock pun intended, into their stocks. And that, while not entirely inaccurate, is not the best way of painting a lot of pictures. For example, you could own stock, let's say that you and a thousand of your friends get together and you create a company and you all own a share. So you have a thousand people each with one share, or you, let's say you have a million shares, you have a thousand people each has a thousand shares, and you own this company and you've been trading the value back and forth at, say, $1 per share, it's worth a million dollars of market cap. And then one day you kind of all universally agree that the company doesn't seem to be making any money. You don't want to sell it. Like you, no one wants to buy anything. Now those shares are worth zero. Now, if that company is making $1 million a year, each of you are going to make $1,000 a year. You've just all agreed, agreed. You're not willing to buy any more of the shares. So in market cap, the company's worth zero. It literally has no value. But in reality, that company is earning you as a group a million dollars a year or individually a thousand dollars a year, which isn't very much, but it's something and it's real. Well, if market cap goes down, it doesn't change how much companies actually earn. That's a separate indicator. So what we're talking about is mostly an indication of how nervous American buyers are in their investment vehicles. And so while it 
means something, it doesn't mean what people generally think. And a whole bunch of companies hitting zero, okay, absolute zero would indicate that it probably has something wrong. Because if you start approaching zero, people with any amount of money will start snatching up companies if they're making any kind of money at all. Because if you could buy an entire company for $5,000 and it makes anything, you're going to do it, right? <laughs> like, like, you can turn that around and make your money back. So that generally is going to happen. But what ends up happening is you have panics and people sell without evaluating if it makes sense to sell. So when we're talking about investments, this is important. We've talked about this before in the show previously, but people are not going to remember this during a panic. And many of you have not watched those episodes. So there are two ways to make money when you're talking about stocks. One is as an investor. That means you hold on to the stock and over time the stock pays you dividends. You buy a stock that's worth $10 and every year it pays a few pennies. You buy a whole bunch of them. Over time they pay you a bit of money. That's how you make money the investing way. If you're doing the trading way, then you buy a stock and then someone says, well, I'll pay you more for that stock than you paid for it. And you say, great. And you sell it to them and you make your money on the difference on the arbitrage. And so that is trading. If you hear about stock traders, that's how they're making their money. Stock investors make their money off the former way. Now, in the real world, all people who are buying and selling stocks are some blend of the two. No one is 100% one or the other. If you're a 100% investor, that would imply that maybe, I guess you could say you bought stock one time and you will never sell them in your life. That would be a pure investor. Uh, a, a pure trader would be someone who never holds shares long enough uh, for them to ever pay dividends. They're just moving them in and out as fast as they can. Um, in reality, you know, anyone who's trading will hold some shares for some long period of time and will eventually take dividends. And anyone who owns stocks generally will buy or sell something at some point and be a trader. So everyone's a mix of the two. But when you're making your money based on dividends, you're an investor. When you're making your money on arbitrage, you are a trader. And so those are important things to understand. Traders are not particularly worried about markets that are going up and down because they make their money on movement. They want a volatile market to make extra money. That's how they're able to make money. Of course, someone doing trades badly is going to lose money even when nothing's happening or when great things are happening. Um, investors don't care if the market cap is going up and down because it doesn't affect their investment. Investment stays the same. So if you're someone who's holding on to stocks for the long haul, you're not worried about buying and selling them day to day. You just have them so that they can generate you revenue over time. The fact that market cap is dropping, while that could be dropping because the companies are becoming bad investments, often it is not tied to that. Very often you can have companies that are doing quite well, paying really good dividends, expected to continue paying good dividends, and still lose market cap because for whatever reason, someone had paid too much for them in the past, someone doesn't understand what they do and is undervaluing them, it doesn't matter. But as an investor, yes, it may be interesting, it may cause some emotional turmoil when you hear that the market cap is dropping, which is what's going on right now, but it doesn't indicate that those companies are unhealthy. It really tells us nothing about those companies at all. Imagine you and your friends own that company, but none of you actually work there. You all own these shares, you all get paid dividends, so you're all emotionally invested in it, but you're purely investors, you're not trading, you just own these shares, money is coming into you. Then one of the people in your group is like, you know what, I heard that the business that we're in, like it isn't doing well, we should all get out. And you guys could all decide that your company's worth nothing. Or someone could be like, hey, um, you know, we, we heard that this is going to be the big thing in the future. And, and someone's willing to pay double what you paid, right? You could have the, the value be really high or really low. And the people who work at the company, have no idea any of this is happening because it hasn't changed anything inside the company. This is you buying and selling the ownership of the company <clears throat> and it may be completely regardless of the inside of the company. The CEO, the staff, the employees, the customers may have zero visibility into the shifts of the market cap of the company and could go about their business making money, losing money, whatever, oblivious to the fact that the owners are having an unrelated discussion thinking that the value is going up and down and having no connection to reality. So this, this happens in the market a lot. And so if you're an investor and you're holding on to your stocks, you don't care what that market is doing. We teach you that you want to know because that's what the news wants to report because it's really good for the news cycle. But as an investor, you don't care. 
So that's the first part. Now, if you are going to buy and sell at some point during your life, you do care that market cap could be dropping on things you already own. But if you're not at a time you want to sell them, then market cap dropping is what you want to be able to buy them so that it will come up over your lifetime so that when you are ready to sell them, they're doing better. Remember, you buy low and sell high. We often get emotionally tied to when we sell, but we forget that you have to buy in order to get there. And in order for there to be good buys for you to be able to sell later, you need the market to come down, either the entire market, as is going on right now, or an individual business to simply be devalued at some point. Maybe they, you know, let's just imagine Apple brings out kind of a stinker with the iPhone 16 and people say, oh, I don't like that phone. And people panic and say the company's not going to make it. And everybody sells their stock at half the value. Well, you can be pretty sure that I, that Apple is going to bring out an iPhone 17 that fixes whatever problems those are, and it'll come back to normal. Sure, they may live, lose a little bit of money as the iPhone 16 doesn't sell quite as well as they hoped. But overall, Apple's fortunes are not going to change that much. But you could buy a bunch of low price Apple stock while people are emotionally panicking about one product that they happen to have high visibility on. You get in, you go, there's no way that's going to be a long term investment problem. And you invest and you make your money. And then over time, the, the value of the shares goes up. But it is the dividends that as an investor really matter to you but you don't want to lose on market cap because you do potentially need to sell those shares someday. So you want to buy low and sell high. So as a trader, you have to remember, you have to buy low, sell high. You can't do any profits if you don't have a volatile market. If, if Apple stayed at perfectly even all the time, sure, it'd pay dividends, but you could you would only lose money on the the transfer fees when you buy and sell. It would be a minimal loss, but it would be a loss. You couldn't make money. So anytime you traded, you would be losing a little bit of money. Only the dividends would protect you in any way to give you some kind of profit. So those are important things to understand as to the mechanisms. Now let's look at a little bit of history because it is common. Remember, most financial education that people are going to give to you is designed to make the rich rich and the poor poor. And so if you're getting an education from high school, you're getting an education from the public, you're getting education from university, chances are they're going to teach you foolish things that sound good because the, the bulk of the economy wants everyone else to fail because it is essentially a zero-sum game. And so in order for somebody to make profits, somebody has to lose that money. And so when you're doing trading, it's always zero-sum. You've got to have losers for there to be winners. When you're doing investments, there can be winners without losers, but it's a lot more difficult to make a lot of money. So that is why trading gets a lot of the attention. But because of this, we have to teach the bulk of investors how to lose money so that the few people who are using common sense or do their research are able to make money. But luckily you're watching my channel and we're going to talk about this. So when there has been market crashes in the past, let's go back and look at the biggest one, 1929. That was as epic as it has ever been. People are jumping out of windows. It was total disaster. People lost everything. Their fortunes were blown away overnight. It was so tragic. If you were, had been a stock investor, you would have lost everything except you wouldn't have because we've shown that as long as you're holding a blended portfolio, it's not just one stock that may have gone out of business, but a number of them. So it protects you. Even some of the worst hit major stocks during the crash of 1929 had rebounded in less than 10 years. This is the most dramatic rebound there ever has been needed in recorded market history, which goes back quite some ways, hundreds of years. In all that time, this was the biggest crash and the recovery was under 10 years. It was, in reality, closer to five years. It would be very, very rare for you to have a stock portfolio that would not have rebounded in under five years. So even if you had known the crash was coming, of course, if you knew the exact moment, there's all kinds of things you would have done to become a trillionaire, right? So clairvoyance is one thing. But even if you knew a general crash was coming and you didn't know exactly when, you still could have protected yourself simply by staying the course. As long as you held stocks for at least five years after the crash, you would have recovered nearly everything. In some cases, you would have recovered in everything. And in a, quite a few cases, you would already have been more profitable than doing anything else. This is what's most important more profitable than doing anything else. All those people are like, well, you got to go to bonds. You got to go to gold. You got to go to the, the market has proven over and 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 over again through history that there's no exception. Nothing rebounds like stocks because stocks 
make money. Everything else is zero sum. So you need stocks because you're actually investing in actual businesses that actually make things, hopefully, and they have the potential to actually grow. Whereas like if you buy gold, it can't grow. You're just betting against inflation, which at times can be a useful bet, but you have to understand it is pure trading. There's no investing. When you are dealing with long terms, right? If you're, if you're in a position where you're about to retire and you think you have to sell your portfolio within the next five years, then you need to worry about market capitalization in a different way because you cannot ride out, potentially, cannot ride out the market. But if you're in a position where you are young, if you are not yet retired, if you don't need to pull on your retirement yet, or if you're in a position where you could be buying instead of selling, then you want there to be a recession now. Recessions, those big drops, those market crashes, anybody who had... So if you had purchased in 1929 the day before the crash, you're like, it'll never crash. And you put all your money in. You would have recovered between five and 10 years. You'd have been in great shape again, as long as you didn't panic and sell during the crash. If you had not done that, but bought after the crash, had that opportunity that you had some money, the crash happened, and then you bought, you would have made so much record profits. It would have been mind blowing. So the thing you want is to be in a position where you have money and can buy stocks still with there being a crash because you need a crash for the big rebound. And the big rebound is how you make the big money because you got to buy really low for that high to sell at. You need a real low to buy at. So this could be the opportunity coming. We could be seeing a drop in market cap, which is going to make buying be the thing that makes sense. The problem is, is that humans are emotional creatures. Trading punishes emotions heavily. We talk about this in a lot of things, but stock trading specifically demolishes people who become emotional because your emotions say, oh, everything's going great. Market's really high. I'm going to buy, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. And then when that high inevitably goes down, you go, oh no, I'm going to lose everything. I have to sell now, which is exactly the wrong second thing to do, right? You're now buying high, selling low because you're riding the emotions. But it should be if your logic was taking over. When the market's really good, you go, it's probably a bubble. I need to, I need to slow down, maybe buy a little bit, but really be careful. And when it crashes, instead of going, no, I've got to sell, you have to say, yes, this is my chance to buy. It is low. I bought high. That was lost opportunity. I should have waited, but I didn't. It doesn't matter. Sunk cost. This is the reality. I now have a low. I can buy. Stocks always go back right? They have always come back in world history. If stocks don't go back, you probably have bigger financial problems than the rebound of the market. Now you're looking at the collapse of civilization. So that's going to be its own problem. And I wouldn't recommend banking on the collapse of civilization. I realize that people make it sound that way now because that's what sells newspapers or whatever. But the reality is, is we are not facing the collapse of civilization. We are not facing the collapse of the world economic order. That is not happening. We're looking at a very small market adjustment. Let's be realistic. And it is an opportunity for you to make an investment rather than to panic and sell what you have. Use this to your advantage. Don't become emotional. Don't be the person giving in the money for everyone else to earn from. We are not looking at financial meltdown, just a financial adjustment. If this was a financial meltdown, none of this would matter. If we're looking at full collapse, whether you bought low, high, your money's worth nothing, that gold's worth nothing, nothing's worth anything, right? All those safe haven things, all those hedges, all those complex vehicles, all of them are going to turn into nothing. Food and water are what are going to matter when there's a full-on economic meltdown. That is not what's happening. We are nowhere near that point. So let's break down a few appropriate reactions. If you're younger and in your working years, embrace this. This is about the best thing that can happen for you. Just keep working and maybe put a little bit more money into investments than you would have done naturally. If you were going to put 5% of your income into investments, maybe crank that up to 7 or 8%. Maybe tighten those belts. Use this as an opportunity to invest while younger. The earlier you invest, when the market is low, the bigger the potential returns over your lifetime. These things compound. Not only do you make more from what you put in in the initial buy low, but you also get it earlier in your life. 
the sooner you're able to do it. And that means there's more time for that to reinvest. And even if it's reinvesting high later in your life, it has more to work with. Uh, but importantly, the earlier you get in, the more dividends you have over your lifetime that go into whatever you need. So it's just, that's a big opportunity. Um, if you are looking at retirement, then you may just be at a time where maybe you need to wait just a little tiny bit longer. Maybe you just want to be a little bit more tightening, tightening your belts just because you don't want to have to hit that retirement uh, sales. You don't want to sell while low or medium. You want to wait till it's high, which will come back, but you want to give it time to be good and healthy. So you don't want to race into things, but it could just be tightening, tightening your belts a little bit. Uh, we often talk about how you should rent instead of buy. Well, if the market goes really low, then you probably want to rent longer, right? Spend more time renting so you don't have to hit your big income to be able to buy a house. Hold that off. If your stocks, stocks, if your stocks go really high, then sell them, buy a house, right? Convert. When it's high, use that to go into something else. When it's low, use what you can to get things into the stocks. It's relatively straightforward, but it's people really don't think when, when we take it into an abstract. Should you buy low and sell high? Of course. But when it comes to in practice, our emotions take us exactly the other way. So it is important to use logic, grab control, and not let your emotions drive you into financial ruin. You can leverage this. The people who are in the toughest position are those that are already retired, starting to live off of their, their portfolios, and they are selling them to do so. If you're only taking uh, um, your, your dividends and using that as, as living income, then you're probably just fine because this does not necessarily impact that. Uh, maybe still tighten your belts and reinvest a little bit because this is one, an opportunity to grow your future retirement and two, it could hedge a little bit should there be a drop in uh, those dividends in the future, but we have no reason to expect that it's, the market is still pretty strong. Uh, the real problem is if you're in a position where you need to be selling right now, that's where if you can hold out about five years, and hopefully you don't even have to hold out that long, hopefully it's much more like two or three, but if there's a major drop that doesn't just rebound right away, uh, then the one thing you can do is tighten that belt and, and spend less. I know for some that's not really possible. If you're in any way on fixed income and can use some of that to invest, this is your chance to do so. Um, it's unfortunate there's always that risk that if you're holding a volatile portfolio, meaning stocks and, and those types of uh, vehicles, that there can be a drop momentarily. In the long haul, stocks are always the way to go. As long as you have enough time to ride out the troughs, they are always going to outperform everything else on the market when taken as a large group, right? Any one stock can do badly, any one bond can do well, but when you take any group of bonds, any group of stocks, it is always, always, always going to be the stocks outperforming. And that is the nature of volatility within investing. Volatility means assurances when taken in a group and it's, we're taught the opposite, again, because the, uh, on a macroeconomic scale, everybody wants you to make big blunders with your investments because that's how everyone else gets richer. So this is just the nature of government-driven education is to drive you to bad decision-making. Not so bad as to drive you into ruin where the state has to bail you out, but bad enough that your life savings are slowly being siphoned off into others. So if you're in that position, then anything you can do to tighten your belts, maybe work a little side job, be creative. And it's unfortunate if there's just nothing you can do and you're forced to be selling your portfolio when it is low, do what you can to isolate those sales and hopefully ride it out as long as possible. That's about the best we can do. At some point, investments do carry risk and there are segments who may be exposed. In the future, if you have a moment, if you're in that position where you are going to be unable to ride out those five-year recovery windows that are necessary for the worst crashes, then at that point, you may want to consider moving at least part of your portfolio enough to ride out the majority of a five-year recovery period into a non-volatile uh, investment vehicle, such as a bond market a fund, uh, something like that. Um, those, while they make very little, they do generally have a means of at least matching, if not beating inflation, and can protect against market crashes, can do really well to protect against market crashes. In a case like this, you would make out as long as you need to use that money within the next small amount of time. But if you were going to be able to ride out those five years, then you still would be hurt by having done that. It seems like 
like it's the thing to do? It is not. So the one thing that you, if you want to get into really volatile trading and take a lot of risks, you can make money on anything, you can leverage anything, but if you're just trying to hold on to something and, and have a relatively stable retirement plan, then staying the course as much as possible is absolutely the thing that is going to protect you here. So I hope all of you are in good, safe positions. I hope none of you have panics over your retirements. Uh, hopefully this gives you good guidance as to how to think about. Remember to buy low and sell high. Do not you let your emotions cause you to make bad financial uh, purchasing decisions. That is um, exactly the place that you are going to go in your mind. And only those who are driven by emotion are going to have the big losses from, from this type of event. And that will be a lot of people, but it's, it's something that you have the power to protect against. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, as long as you haven't lost, if you've lost your life savings, do not put money into the channel. But if you're doing okay and you'd like to support what we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me. It makes a huge difference. It helps me be able to put out this show every day. And as always, if you could like, subscribe, tell someone about the show. I will see all of you tomorrow.